loved ones, I hope you enjoyed your break. So it is my pleasure to announce the next speaker, Hala Sheta, who will be talking about um, uh, the economy of creative AI systems. So whenever you're ready, Hala, you can take it away. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hala, and I'm a cognitive science major minoring in computer science and linguistics. So today we'll be talking about computational creativity and evaluating the possibility of autonomous creative systems. To frame the problem, we firstly need to understand what we mean by creativity in the human and artificial sense and how we consume and evaluate creative artifacts. Observers like you and me and the extent of their knowledge on computation and software play a large role in tackling this problem. Since, well, in general, artists don't create in a vacuum and their creativity or lack thereof may be an area of contention to others, especially since there is no defined metric that we can use to truly evaluate creativity. Now, this is especially the case with regards to AI, since their potential is constantly in doubt, so they must prove to us that they exhibit intelligence. In the field of computational creativity, which is a relatively new subfield of AI, uh, the most widely accepted definition of creativity is geared towards output, where it is defined as the ability to generate novel and valuable artifacts with some variations additionally maintaining the property of intentionality. So as a result, most developments in the field were focused on artifact generation systems, as you can see, um, with, like the painting fool, which is an independent creative system, or AI con, which is a co-creative system involving live human and machine collaboration. Now, these developments are concerned with the simulation of human-like creativity. And while great technological feats um, these systems are deemed as weak creative systems or weak AI because the extent of their autonomy, which is um, the degree to which these systems can act independently of their inner build or the way they were programmed is usually very limited with the developers focusing on supervised learning and um, generating artifacts up to par with or surpassing human produced artifacts. Now for the purposes of truly intelligent um, artificial systems, we need to focus on developing strong creative systems, structurally supplied with the means to create and given some autonomy in their process leading to the final output. So exhibiting intelligent creative behavior. With that, the argument here is that to observe creative behavior in an AI system, its creative process must manifest a cycle of purposive decision-making that an unbiased observer can attribute with, the, with autonomous intentionality, the most essential component of human creative behavior. Now, the observer is able to make that decision based on the system's framing of its process, which reflects intentionality and autonomy in the choices leading up to the, to the final product. Now, naturally, um, artificial systems may not express this in natural language like we do, but framing may uh, represent anything created by the system to alter its audience's perception of its creative work, like meta-level commentary, for example. Furthermore, developments in the field should focus on designing systems with presence, as Cook and Colton proposed, which defines the system's um, creative identity and cultural impact. This will help us as observers better monitor these systems' creative behavior and allow them to grow. As most systems reset after every cycle of creation, this allowing for any further learning or evaluation of its previous works. But before getting into that, we must firstly be acquainted with our conception of human creativity and how we consume and evaluate human artifacts, since that forms the baseline of how we would consume computational artifacts. So creativity and by extension art is a human centric notion of which the essence of is constantly questioned and redefined. Arguably the most consistent property shared by all artworks is that they are manifestations of intentionality. The notion of art can be anything if I want it to be. Now, while very controversial to communicate that intentionality, um, the creator and the observer need a common conceptual understanding of the world to some extent for the creator to be able to convey a certain comment on those concepts. 
So in consuming these artifacts, we implicitly expect some sort of human connection since they are created by humans attempting to appeal to our mind or emotions. Now, Colton et al. maintain that we cannot carry this expectation forward in the consumption of computational artifacts, since that leads to bias about the system's communicative ability, the classic Searle's Chinese room problem. This does not mean, however, that there's no inherent value in exploring how computational processing can lead to a creative artifact, but we must keep this distinction in mind that with AI systems, we may need to redefine our current notion of creativity or observe creativity, but not as we know it. But for these systems to convince us, however, we need autonomy in addition to intentionality in the system's framing so that the appraisal of the product can be attributed to the system rather than its developers. Okay, moving on to our evaluation of art. So our perception and subsequent confirmation of the artist's intentionality directs our admiration towards them. Um, take this frame from a film I haven't watched as a photograph. As an observer, you project your admiration on your presupposition of artistic intention. So you may enjoy the contrast between the unknowing blurry figures in the warm background and the rushed distressed figures in the foreground and how that conveys a sense of urgency and disconnect. Your admiration of the piece is then translated to an admiration of the artist, if and only if in investigation of their creative process, your former presupposition is confirmed as actual artistic intention rather than your own production of meaning which still doesn't take away from your enjoyment of it, of course. But this is especially the case um, with regards to AI, because um, wait, as reflected in Ventura and Mumford's experiments surrounding um, exploring the skepticism surrounding computational creativity, where the most cynical participants required evidence that the system could think for itself. So they necessarily required that framing, that creative process from the system. So we know that bias can manifest because of a lack of proper framing, but furthermore, since we are dealing with artificially intelligent systems, observers usually carry their preconceived notions on the system's level of consciousness or agency relative to them. So although these issues are outside the scope of my paper, we need to address our biases towards them since they are central to the conception of strong AI. So firstly, Okay, consciousness and autonomy are necessarily intertwined, but they are not equivalent. And arguably a system can exhibit some autonomy in its actions leading to the final product without having consciousness. So we aren't making any claims about the system's level of consciousness when we're assessing its autonomy. We're just um, evaluating the flexibility of its inner build in allowing it to enact decisions. But anyway, to combat bias towards that, many have proposed Turing test style evaluations where observers are given a mix of human and computational artifacts and asked to blindly evaluate them. Now, this approach maintains that both types of artifacts um, can be evaluated by the same metric, disregarding the humanity gap. So it does not actually target the underlying problem. In addition to that, for non-blind evaluations, positive bias may manifest, where observers highly rate a creative artifact by virtue of it being created by a novel system. In terms of agency, uh, we will be focusing on systems with human world agency rather than entities acting in um, computer simulated worlds or micro worlds with multiple agents because such systems are usually focused on um, testing certain models of creativity with a focus on growing the world and witnessing the agents interact. So for an arbitrary agent in these systems, we usually witness a lack of uh, transparency in the creative process and a randomness in intention. And thus we will be focusing on systems situated in our environment with careful consideration of the biases that I just talked about. Okay, moving on from taking the view of observers to now being creators, uh, we analyze human creative behavior, again, as the baseline for its artificial manifestation. 
So the creative process entails a pursuit of, of achievement that is in constant risk of failure. Success is in flux and completely defined by the agent. Looking at Nelson's investigation of the creative processes of different artists, we can see that the creative process necessarily entails intention in the following stages. So initiation and selection or formulation of the guiding idea, um, development and termination. So starting with initiation, the initiation of the creative process springs from an urge to create for some purpose. Now this purpose can be as abstract as catharsis or more concrete like societal critique or gushing over a cute creature you drew, which is more emotionally driven in contrast to a technical purpose like wanting to draw a comic. Now, importantly, this purpose is heavily related to the agent's subjective worldview, highlighting the environmental aspect of the creative process and the importance of integrating presence into these systems. So this purpose guides the directives that an agent takes on when they're creating, which are not rigidly defined but implicitly aid in the allocation of mistakes or contributions to the piece that don't feel right, because what makes a mistake is completely defined by the creator. Now we can call the culmination of all these directives that are guiding the piece, the guiding idea of the piece, which may change throughout the, the process. Note that the purpose may influence the guiding idea, but it does not have to. Its formulation may be separate as with cathartic creation. So we observe intention in the initiation of the creative process and the formulation or selection of the guiding idea. In terms of the guiding idea though, creative systems designed for presence and autonomy should be able to non-randomly formulate a guiding idea based on their knowledge base. Here we direct our focus to the mechanism that a system uses to formulate its guiding idea. So how and why it selected the guiding idea of cute dog and its conceptual understanding of cute and dog in isolation and in combination. Also, systems may be supplied with a general knowledge base that reflects common societal knowledge, which will naturally be a projection of the programmer's worldview, but that is not a problem because we are more interested in the system's long-term growth and knowledge base expansion. Okay, next, the development stage which is arguably the most general of the three because of its variation across disciplines. But in essence, it relies on constant evaluation of progress and may be highly unpredictable. So here, the creator's guiding idea is clarified through a rhythmic sequence of constant evaluation and manipulation where they are allocating or embracing diversions from the set guiding idea. Now, including um, evaluation as an internal component of a system is not novel to the field of computational creativity, usually manifesting as some mechanism the system uses to rate its own generated structures, like in artifact generation systems. So for example, their repeated use of a fitness function to distinguish candidates of poor quality that do not make it to the final output. However, the problem here lies in the objectives that a system uses to evaluate, whether these objectives are internally set or fixed or non-fixed, so by the system, or externally set and fixed by the developers. Where more independent systems would evaluate based on internally set parameters relative to their target domain. Okay, anyway, the creator is continuously making decisions in development until they arrive at a sense of completion, intentionally terminating development on the artifact as a reflection of the satisfaction of the guiding idea. In the aftermath, the creator is given an opportunity to self-evaluate and then commits the totality of experience gained from creating to their memory, depending on its artistic significance. Okay, so now we will be looking at attempts at mechanizing human creative behavior. Specifically, we will evaluate the autonomy of two, independ two independently creative systems both of which have been deemed to be artists in their own right by their own creators. So engineered with the capacity for intention and to communicate that intention in their creative process. I will be focusing here solely on independent and not co-creative systems like AICon because the latter relies on continuous feedback and equality of contribution 
Um, and through my research, no code creative system has been adequately developed with the capacity to properly frame its actions relative to its human collaborator. Excuse me. Anyway, starting with Darcy. So Darcy is composed of an image generation and an image perception component. Its image generation component, sorry, its image, its image perception component is essentially its knowledge base, which maps um, images to semantic information using adjective association. And the image generation component is its creative process, which is made up of composition and rendering. So in its creative process, Darcy uses its knowledge base to decompose a given concept into constituent subconcepts, and then um, composing the iconography of each of the subconcepts into a single image. Then it renders this image by selecting an image filter, depending on its perceptual understanding of that concept. So Darcy can be deemed to be intentional in its choice of conceptual icons and style of rendering. However, Darcy's framing of its process relative to its inner structures must be available for us to be convinced of its autonomy. So is it autonomous? Well, since autonomy is an ill-defined concept, Ventura argues that if Darcy demonstrates imagination, inspiration, and the ability to generate meta-level artifacts, then it enjoys some level of autonomy in its creative process. So, okay. The imagination that Darcy exhibits relies on a primitive association mechanism, allowing it to create images for concepts that it has not learned before. However, this does not actually prove that Darcy is autonomous, rather it exhibits the versatility of its inner workings. Now concerning the creation of meta-level artifacts, Darcy uses a fix fixed fitness function to generate an appropriate style in the communication of a particular concept. So as you can see in the photo, combining a style that communicates fear with a robot image. However, this attribution of meta level to Darcy's artifacts is based on Ventura's understanding of Darcy's nature as a novel system, a novel artificial system. And so it, does not, it is not really meta intentionally and does not actually add to its autonomy as a creator. In terms of inspiration though, Darcy is able to selectively take inspiration from aspects of different source images like the colors or the mood of an image, communicating its reasoning about its decisions and its framing of its process. And so this demonstrates that it does exhibit some autonomy in its creative process. So in terms of a conclusive evaluation, Darcy does not initiate its creative process nor select its own guiding idea. It develops its artifacts rhythmically demonstrating intentionality in its framing. But Ventura mentions that its internal parameters that it uses to evaluate are externally set. It terminates when the communication of the concept is satisfied, but it resets after every termination, meaning that it has no presence or ability to expand its knowledge base. And so Darcy is highly intentional in its creative process, but demonstrates little to no autonomy. Excuse me. Okay, moving on to Angelina, a game, design, a game design system that was redeveloped multiple times. So Angelina has a modular build where each module or species we can call them is responsible for optimizing or evolving its function relative to the larger task of creating a game. So there are essentially multiple evolutionary systems which additionally work simultaneously, the term cooperative coevolution. So the parameter that each species is responsible for is optimized relative to the other parameters. And this optimization is primarily done by running low res game simulations. So for example, the rule set design species would attempt to optimize its parameters relative to the layout and level design species. Okay, and when a certain stopping condition is reached, Angelina's work is deferred to a finishing module using inline code replacement to um, convert the abstracted internal representation of the game that it was working on into an executable playable game. <clears throat> now versions one to five of Angelina all rely on the same overarching core structure with improvements made to slowly increasing the system's creative independence and versatility in genres. 
But in general, the limitations of versions one to five encompass previous concerns that we had with properly evaluating creative behavior, such as observers lack of ability to attribute intentionality, which is a direct consequence of its um, inner structure, the simultaneous task completion part, and its lack of presence. <clears throat> and thus, Cook and Colton introduced Angelina version six, which was designed for continuous creation and presence with longer design cycles to allow for better framing. So not simultaneous anymore. This framing occurs through a constant updating of its metadata file, which details the maintenance of tasks and projects and their successes and failures. So reasons behind its choice not to release a game, for example. Um, it initiates and ends its own creative process, moving between different um, tasks and terminating as it sees fit. It is theoretically designed to make games forever. And although it is not kept running infinitely for energy conservation purposes, um, it does not reset in terms of memory or progress in between shutdowns. So it is also able to exist in cyberspace as a creator, gathering ideas via Google milking and engaging with the community in the form of Twitter interactions. And its use of a custom um, language theoretically allows it to learn from and evaluate other people's games like it evaluates its own. However, this aspect remains in development and is not currently implemented. <clears throat> so as we saw, Angelina's redesign demonstrates processes that exhibit intention and some level of autonomy throughout its creative process. However, some limitations not properly articulated in the redesign include the exact process that Angelina uses to evaluate. So the weighting parameters that allow it to favor a task or a project over another, and whether these parameters are externally set or internally set. This is mentioned as being recorded in the file it uses for framing, but the mechanism of decision is vaguely defined. This also extends to Angelina's ability to expand its knowledge base through the learning of new mechanisms. It is not clear how it incorporates um, new knowledge given its modular build and restricted communication in cyberspace. But its theoretical design is still solid, aiming to exhibit autonomous intentionality on some level and will surely aid in the realization of intelligent systems in computational creativity. So what's the takeaway? Well, overall developments of strong creative systems must work towards incorporating proper framing and presence, allowing for autonomy in the creative process and enabling us to further evaluate and observe creative growth as observers. Also, since this is an AI complete problem involving the translation of human level intelligence onto artificial agents, uh, progressions in this domain will also aid in uh, the developments of strong AI. Furthermore, we should work towards redefining our current culture of creativity to include computational artifacts, since there is certainly value and enjoyment in computationally produced artifacts. Um, and there's also that second meta level of creativity attributed to the developers who are able to uh, design their software to perform unpredictably, but also intentionally. And I'll leave you with this excerpt from an exhibition slash in implicit social experiment that um, where the system paints live portraits of its audience based on its mood. And you can ask me about it if you'd like, but that's it, thank you. All right, round of applause for Hala. Thank you so much for that presentation. So I just have a couple of questions that are coming in. Yeah. So the first question is, how can we have autonomy in a system without making claims about its consciousness? Okay, so essentially the way I presented autonomy was the extent to which a system's inner build um, allows it to perform actions that are independent of what was developed basically. So if a system is given algorithms, um, autonomy here is a measure of the system's flexibility. So if, if human autonomy is the, if we were to put autonomy on a spectrum and human autonomy is the goal, then I don't think um, that's the sense of autonomy that we're talking about here. It's more of um, having a flexible system and this can, 
primarily be done actually by introducing some mechanism in the system to absorb um, outside stimuli. Like actually in the painting pool, in the photo that you can see here, basically the system um, decides to create based on its mood. So it can read the news and it has six moods. And if it's in a negative mood, it actually doesn't create at all. So, and it outputs this phrase to the audience that no random numbers were generated in the formulation of this decision. But yeah, that's, that's what I mean by autonomy, just introducing some flexibility into the system to allow it to perform unpredictably, but also intentionally. I hope that answered your question. No, that's very interesting. Um, all right, so another question here is that um, I've noticed that both Darcy and Angelina divides the task of performing creative behavior into subtasks to some degree. Do you think this is this fully captures the top level decisions often fundamentally involved in such a process? Um, actually, it depends on the creative domain, I guess, because with game design, you would you would be doing the same thing. You would divide the task of creating the game into designing the levels and then making the sprites and so on. But for example, with painting, um, it's more just on the spot. But I guess what Darcy is doing isn't really painting. It's more um, trying to decompose a concept, trying to understand what a concept entails and then rendering it based on its understanding of that concept. So in some sense, yes, but in some sense, no. Yeah. Um, there's a follow up to that question. But then at the same time, often game designs involve designing the story and narrative of the game. Yeah. Right? There's going to be a, I think there's a follow up uh, message to this that's being typed out. Um, okay. Sorry. So we'll just. <laughs> okay, uh, fine. Um, Jeremy, if you want to confirm that if there's more coming. I'm sorry, there's no, no more coming. Oh, there's more. Okay, all right. <laughs> so essentially that at the same time, often game designs involves designing the story and narrative at the, of the game, I guess yeah. at the same time, right? Okay. Oh, there's no follow-up? No, I think that was just the added message. Wait, so sorry, can you repeat that? The narrative and... Uh, the involves designing the story and the narrative of the game. So game designs evolving. So at the same time, often game designs involve designing the story and narrative, as well as I guess just the aesthetics. Yeah, but okay. So I want to jump in. Uh, you, you mentioned yeah. like the the game design can be divided down into like designing each level. Right? I was more thinking, but at the same time. Um, there's often like an overarching design of how to connect the, the different levels together to make a you know holistic yeah. story. So I'm wondering if if like if if a system is fundamentally um, well, I guess designed to be <laughs> to designing a task, in, yeah. to dividing a task into like subparts, then would that would the, the the holistic aspect be missed out? I, I mean, mean or, or touch. I mean. Yes, kind of. It's it's sort of reductionistic, of course, because how it um, works is that it optimizes each part relative to the other parts. So it's, I mean, it's kind of holistic, but kind of not. It's, they're pretty vague about it, but um, yeah, it's pretty reductionistic because it's a system and not a human creating, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure um, how to answer that properly. Great, great. Okay, so um, there's another question here. So the postmodernist said that whether or not something was art had more to do with context. Building from that, wouldn't okay. a turning test be mute? be moot, since by asking the question, an object is no longer viewed as an object, but as potential art? Wait, can you repeat that? Did yes, you mean Turing test? I think it says tur turning test, but it, I, I do believe that Turing test makes more sense in context. Yeah. So building from the idea of the postmodernist, uh, the postmodernists, which said that whether or not something was art had more to do with context. 
So building okay. on that idea, wouldn't a Turing test be moot or since by asking the mere question, an object is no longer viewed as an object, but as potential art? Yeah. Yeah, because you're, you're, um, and then thus becomes art is the added. It's basically, yeah, it's actually um, a similar problem to what you had, Isha, with in your presentation, what where you were saying, is this anger? Is this face, does this face demonstrate anger? So you're actually like sort of priming, priming the observer to project their own um, conception of what art is onto that. And that's why it's also not um, a good way to test why, um, whether something is art or not. But also um, when you're, I mean, I can just frame anything and call it art. Like that's the intentionality part is what makes art art. I'm, and that's uh, linked to what you said about the context. Mm -hmm. So yeah, your understanding of intentionality and your interpretation of the concept make a uh, context makes it art. But yeah, you are priming the observers to considering something as art. And that's why those tests aren't um, good evaluations. Great, I think that answered Emre's question. And okay. um, that is all the questions we have. So thank you for your presentation, okay. Hala. It thank was you. very informative. Um, just a reminder to our attendees that we are hosting a raffle. So you are eligible.